Okay. Welcome to our seventh Bible study in this series that I've retitled as God and His People, because it's foundational to understanding the book of Revelation. So in this series, we're in the seventh study. And today we're going to talk about God's God delivers his people. And today is August 4, 2022. Got the day. <laughs> so exciting because it kind of ties in with the, that 10th plague is when they were actually delivered. God did the beginning of his deliverance. And we're going to see how this all ties into us, to Jesus, to the children of Israel, God's people in the Old Testament there. And it's going to be a very profound study, I believe. And we're going to end with communion today because it ties clearly to what we're talking about today. So <clears throat> let's get going here. Tim, would you have a prayer to just bless us as this time together? Thank you, Lord, for knowing that as we meet in your name, that you are here present with us. And we ask for uh, an ability to sense your presence and to be open to the guidance uh, of your spirit, our hearts and minds, that, that your word can come alive uh, to us as we consider the things that you have written and uh, for our instruction and strengthening and that we can be stronger and building up as a part of the body of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for prospering this time together. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We're glad you're here, Lynn and Dennis mm -hmm. and Gail and Tim, that you can all be here together with us today and just joining us at this study. And we welcome any of you that are watching this on the YouTube that you can be blessed as you're going through the study with us today. Um, God's calendar for the Israelites starts with his great deliverance mm -hmm. did you know that he has a calendar in the bible and he has a calendar for his people and it starts with begins with god delivering his people from egypt that's called the first month of the year first month that's how he counts time begins with his deliverance <laughs> of course he doesn't have time up there but we have time down here Remember that the tenth plague was plague. The tenth plague against Egypt was judgment on the wicked and all their gods. And at the very same moment when that tenth plague hit the Egyptians, God's people were preserved and delivered. The firstborn of Egypt died. The firstborn of the Israelites lived. We're going to first turn to Genesis 49, 3, and talk about the significance of the firstborn before we get into this. Um, and we will get to Exodus 12 in a little bit, but we won't have time to read all of Exodus 12. If you haven't had a chance to read it, you might have to go back and review it, but we're going to cover the main points. So if you'd like to know where we're taking some of the things we're going to talk about today, it's out of Exodus 12. We re will read some of the passage out of Exodus 12. But we're turn back to Exodus 49, 3. It helps us give a clue. We've talked about this before, firstborn. But just as a reminder, as we're talking about firstborn today, who will read Genesis 49, 3 for us? This is in I, I can. Oh, excuse me. Thank you, Janice. Uh, basically, um, it's it's in the context, and we'll get you. You'll get the next one, Gail. Okay. <laughs> Jacob's blessing his sons right before he dies. Remember, he had the twelve sons, and he's giving them the blessing, and he starts with his firstborn, and this is what he says: uh, "You are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength." the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. New King James. Oh, okay. Go ahead and read verse four and I'll come read it in IV. <laughs> four or three. Read I'm just going to- You read verse three. Go ahead and read verse four. Just, you might as well say it too, just to go. Unstable as water, you shall not 
Excel because you went up to your father's bed, then you departed. He went up to my couch. Yeah, so remember, we talked about this before in a previous study. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength. My might, the first sign of my strength in excelling in honor, excelling in power. He had the firstborn inheritance. He was due the firstborn inheritance. But remember, he went to bed with one of the slaves and went up on his father's couch and defiled his father's bed. Mm. You remember we talked about that before and I gave the passage in a previous study. He forfeited in a sense, the firstborn privileges. And it's interesting, the firstborn of, of actually of, let's see, it was Rachel, firstborn Joseph. Mm -hmm. He got Ephraim and Manasseh, remember? Ephraim and Manasseh, he had the double portion of the firstborn, Joseph did, interestingly enough. But there was one that was exalted as king, and that comes out of the fourth tribe, the tribe of the Judah. So I just want to be a couple of things clear here. But he was supposed to get the firstborn inheritance. So if he was the first, the firstborn, my might, the first sign of my strength, what does this tell you about the importance of firstborn? I'm going to be asking a lot of questions today, the significance of things and as we go along. We'll just pop right along to the study. What was important about being the firstborn? So, well, with this, chosen of God. Well, it showed something about the Father. The first life mm -hmm. comes out of the Father. That's true. It was chosen. God chose the firstborn sons to carry on the Father's name to rule in the name of the father, establish the father's name, rule over the family in the father's ways, which were supposed to be under the authority of God. Remember back to Genesis one and the whole study on authority that we did. <clears throat> they also were continue the family line. Firstborn sons then, if they were supposed to help that family survive, what are they even doing? If somebody was a widow, they're- yeah, they had to take care of all of them. They had to take care of them. Help. Yeah. That's yeah. the reason why they had so much of the inheritance because they were responsible to take care of all the family, keep them alive, provide for them. Notice who did that in the tribe. Which tribe was it? Who was it of the 12 sons that did that for all the family of Jacob? It was Joseph. Joseph. He went down to Egypt and he, he provided all, you know, through him. All the food necessary for sustaining that family was provided. Isn't that interesting? Not only for him, but also for Egypt. He's a type of Christ, as we know Joseph is in the Old Testament. So notice he took that firstborn role, Joseph did, in a sense. So firstborn is very significant because they're to care for the family. Now, in Exodus 12, it talks about who can participate in the Passover with God's people. And it's Exodus 12, 43 to 47. I you maybe have to 57. I don't think you've probably read that, but we don't won't take the time. I'll just tell you what it is because we are going to be scrunched on, you know, getting through the things, the important points here. So where are you moving to? Where Exodus, what did you say? 12. It's oh. oh, okay. Exodus I'm there. 12, which is about the Passover. And it's 43 to 47. I think that's um, to 49, actually. I got that written wrong in here. Uh, Exodus 12, 43 to 49. Okay. I'll tell you briefly what it was. It was a slave that you personally own, but he had to be circumcised. Remember what circumcision was? Supernatural family part of the in the Old Testament. He had to be circumcised. He could not be a temporary resident. He couldn't be somebody that you had hired to work for you. So he's not temporarily there. He's not a hired worker. Now, if an alien living you wanted to go and be part of God's people, they could do this. They could participate in the Passover, actually. 
but they'd have to have all males in their household circumcised. In other words, they're entering in to the, to the family of God by that. That's a sign, remember, of being part of God's people. And then they can take part as one as if they were born in the land. They could take part as if they're born in the land. Can you believe it? I wonder sometimes if some of those officials of Pharaoh went down to Goshen, said, please, I hear something. You have life here. Something's going on. I made my decision under the eighth. And I pray, hey, can I be in your, can I be this? We'll circumcise all your males and come on down and be part of us in our household. I don't know. We don't know this from the Bible, but I'm wondering that myself. Could they have some of them? Because we do know some points about the piece that we'll talk about little bit of that when we get into the part two about the people. So the Passover, on the 10th day of the first month, 10 is the number of, you know, I'm always throwing out numbers, 10 is the number of? Testing. Testing, yes. This is the test. The father has to pick a lamb or a goat, a year old, a male without defect. Now, how does this represent Jesus? We know it. So I'm going to ask you these things. We go along. Think it, just throw them out. You know. How does a lamb represent Jesus? Without blemish. And Without blemish. So he's sinless. Something's wrong with My this. My internet is coming Some, in. And out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're stuck. <laughs> yeah, okay. Frozen. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you, but you're not moving. <laughs> oh, man. What to do? Yeah. It says my internet is unstable. I don't know what to do. Should we try? To, I don't know. I might just be stuck. Will it's, I be stuck the rest of the time? Well, just, I, I can, when you talk, we can hear you, but. But you can't see me changing anything in the thing. Just, yeah, you're, it's kind of delayed extremely. It's okay. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll listen to you. We can move back to the other room. Would that be better? We don't ask them, do we? Well, we can uh, try it. Yeah. It's closer to where my internet is. Would it be better okay. to try to move to the back room? Tell that me, might. ladies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're going to move. We're going to move. Just hold on tight. We're going to move. Um. <laughs> It might connect with us a little better back here. Here we go. Hold tight. We're moving. Another room in the house. Okay. Thanks for your patience. I don't know how to do it on pause. I guess I could have unrecorded it or something. Okay. I think that that's, see, can you see us moving at all now? I'm getting sick. Yeah, it's much better. It's okay. Much better. This is the closest place in the house to uh, our internet connection. So hopefully this is going to work today. <laughs> so we just moved. Thank you for your patience as we moved. Okay. So the father would choose the lamb or the goat. Significant, right? The father chooses it but it had to be just enough for as many people that would be eating this lamb or goat why was that important well i thought it was interesting that that everyone was given their portion it had to be enough that each one got their portion that each had enough and that and that whatever was left over of course would be destroyed but i thought about that how we are given our portion from Jesus. He gives us what we need and, and we're just what we need. That's how I saw that. And the salvation is sufficient for anyone that receives it and takes mm -hmm. it in. It says yeah. here, if, um, if in four, it says, if any household's too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having yeah. to take into account the number of people there are. Right. They had to do it that way. They had to, that's good, Gail. Thanks for bringing that out. Yeah. So here, you could put two families together. You know, they could just, right. whatever that lamb's going to be or that goat's going to be, it had to be the right amount for the amount of people are going to be. Eating. Right. So it was important because there was significant reason for that. And it was 
that God, that his provision is just enough for anybody who chooses it, but no more. But we are, we, they were, de they were de to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. Yeah. So that, I thought that was interesting. You had to take it in to yourself. Yeah. You had to yeah. participate in it. Yeah. Kids, not adults, the whole bit. All right. Okay. <clears throat> and why could it be a lamb or a goat? And we know it's without defect and it had to be male and it had to be one year old because just one lamb, one sacrifice. But why could it be a lamb or a goat? The lamb is obvious. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He's perfect lamb. But why a perfect goat? Why could it be one or the other? Wasn't it because also, of course, there was the scapegoat that they used in the ceremonies later. Yes. Um, represent You're right, Liam. On the Day of Atonement, we see clearly that goats were used in sin offerings in the Old mm -hmm. Testament. They had to be perfect because Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin on the cross, didn't he? Just then. That's when he did it, those three hours on the cross when he hung there when it turned dark. And so the father is to take care of that lamb and goat. Oh, by the way, one other thing I wanted to mention, Jesus, it was the 10th day of the month when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that triumphal Sunday. That was the 10th day of the month. And how do we know that? Because we know that Thursday night was Passover and the next day was the feast. And we do know also, that um, basically it talks about it being a preparation day, but it always refers to Friday. So we have no doubt about when Jesus was crucified. There's big debates, but when you understand scripture, preparation date was always Friday. So when you count back, you can count the days. You can count one, two, three, four, five. It always counts the first day and the last day. If it says three days, it means the day it happens, another day, and the third day, he rises again. <laughs> it counts beginning and ending days. Mm -hmm. Seven days of feet, she got the first day and the seventh day. But you have seven days, you know, but, it, you know, that's, that's just how they count things back in the Hebrew. When you're reading the Bible, it helps you understand that. So who chose the lamb when Jesus rode in on that triumphal entry? The lamb rides in, and who chose him? <laughs> the father chose his son to ride in on that 10th day of the first month absolute fulfillment to the day that's how god is so precise in the old and the new and the father chose the lamb his only begotten son people recognize jesus as the son of david the king of israel now back to the passover the father was to take care of the lamb or goat guarding that sacrifice god the father protected jesus from his enemies there were several times they tried to kill him mm -hmm. god protected him from his enemies he would not die until he died under the cup of god's wrath 14th day which is five days later because you count 10 11 12 13 14 five is the number of grace the 14th day double sevens <laughs> it's enough for old and new testament total accomplishment they were to slaughter the we'll call it the lamb because he's called the passover lamb so we refer to the lamb but it might have been the goat okay they're slaughtered when what time of day on the 14th day what time of day on the 14th day did they slaughter twilight twilight, twilight right at sundown why at sundown I'm picking it apart. I'm picking every little detail because there's details of why he said at sundown. Because the sun, light has gone down. The night has begun. You remember the evening and the morning are the first day. For six days of the week, it talks about the evening and morning, meaning a liberal day starts at sundown. In God's calendar of a day, night is first, and he is the light who pierces the darkness. It always ends in day. God's days always end in light. Mm. God's days always end in day. It's amazing how God is. 
They always inundate. You can listen from the refrigerator. <laughs> What's he doing? He can listen from there. It's fine. <laughs> My husband just came out oh, to get a drink. <laughs> anyway, I said, uh, I'm glad he was there. He can do that. <laughs> darkness falls over the land. Egypt had rejected the light. Remember the ninth plague was darkness and had chosen darkness instead of light. And judgment would fall on that dark, evil kingdom, the kingdom of darkness. By the way, Jesus on the cross, I'm going to do th- uh, illustrations, comparisons of Jesus all the way through this. As he is the fulfillment of all this. It all pointed really to him. Jesus on the cross, on the sixth hour, he, they hung him on the cross in their third hour, on the sixth hour, which is equivalent to our noon, the brightest time of the day at six o'clock. The sixth hour, which is the number of man, by the way, it says in Luke that the sun stopped shining. And for three hours, darkness descended over the whole land as Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. And God poured his judgment against the world, the judgment that they were guilty. And poured that judgment against the world. And it fell on Jesus, poured it out on Jesus, the Lamb. So we're talking blood here. Blood equals what? Life. Yeah, I got the left. Blood is the life is in the blood. And they were to take some hyssop and dip it in a bowl filled with the blood from the sacrifice. Killed animal. Dip the hyssop. And what would they do with it? With this hyssop. Put it on the doorpost. They used it to apply it to the doorpost on both sides and above. So everything, nothing would come through that door. It was protected. Nothing would come to, they'd have to pass, come through that blood to get into that house. (laughs) It keeps evil out and got people safe. The blood, the blood kept them safe. Um, David said in Psalm 51, that Psalm when he was sinned against God with his sin with Bathsheba he said cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean wash me and I will be white as snow cleanse me with hyssop Jesus when he shed his blood on the cross so we could have life yeah go ahead so hyssop it it was like it's like a digestive type hyssop's an herb Uh uh-huh and so why, I wonder why he picked him. Well, it's interesting that on the cross, when Jesus said, I thirst, remember the living water mm-hmm. was dried up when he became sin, mm. symbol of the water flowing out of Adam. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when he said, I thirst, soldiers dipped a sponge in wine vinegar, put mm-hmm. it on hyssop and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And when he had received the drink, he said, it is finished, and he died. He received that drink of that that wine, vinegar, instead of the pure new wine of the vine, is the wine of the world, you might say. Turned to vinegar, wine that had turned to vinegar. You see that wine press of God's wrath. In, in Revelation 16, where when he's pouring, you know, he, he tread that wine press for us. So we don't have to be trampled when that happens and judgments poured out on the wicked of the land. I'm just full of all kinds of illustrations out of this today. Hope you don't mind just passing them all through because I see Jesus everywhere in this. Mm-hmm. If you see anything else, just bring it up, ladies and gentlemen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Stay in the house. Oh, Jesus shed his blood on the cross so we, he died, so we can live, have life. He said, stay in the house until morning. All night long, they were to stay in the house. Note that eighth plague of hail. Take your slaves and your cattle into shelter, 
in their house or the place they live. Their house was to be the dwelling place of the family that protects life. The shelter protects the animals and their families, those sacrificial animals. The, the house protects the people. <laughs> that protect the family, stay in the house, that place of protection has the blood over the door, surrounding that door. <clears throat> and to take no meat, none of that animal outside the house. It had to stay in the house. It could not go outside the house. The meat could not be raw, eaten raw, or cooked in water. It had to be roasted over fire. Why fire? What does fire represent? Purification, Holy Spirit. Judgment. Oh, and judgment. The judgment. The oh, yeah. judgment. fire of God. He he can God, our God is consuming fire. Now that is purification, man. Yeah, there's, there's some truth of being a purification because he purifies the whole world. He's once more, he's not going to cleanse it with water, he's going to destroy it with fire. He's getting rid of every bit of equalness. Of e evil, excuse me, not equalness, evil out of the world. So, yes, there, there's something about it. There's a baptism of fire that also comes on us to cleanse out any evil out of our hearts. So, that in a sense, you're, it's both. It can be purification on us, but in the sense of what it was doing to Egypt, it was judgment. But it was a purification of the whole world. You might say because Egypt is a type of the kingdom of the Lord. We talked about this before. So Jesus took our judgment, as we know. Eat with eat it with bitter herbs. Jesus said he was going to drink the bitter cup. Mm -hmm. And three times in the Garden of Eden, he said, Abba, Father. That's where he used that term Abba, which is that endearing term we're to use in talking to our the Father in heaven. It means my dad. <laughs> not just the father up there he's mine abba father <clears throat> if it's possible let this cup pass from me but if not not my will but yours be done what was that cup he was talking about to pass from him what was the cup it's the cup of thought this through. Yes, the cup of wrath. Poured full strength out on the wicked in the end. It was a proof right there that there was no other way than this for the jet for the salvation of mankind. No other way but the cup of God's wrath. That's, that's the very death of Jesus Christ. Can you all hear me okay back here? Is it working okay? Mm -hmm. Checking. Yes. Yes. Bread. Pick the staff of life. Bread is the staff of life. There's to be no yeast. Yeast permeates the bread. What did yeast represent here? Sin. Sin. Exactly. Sin. Yeast was to be removed from their houses, no less, before this. On that first day, that day, they had to have a... They, had to have the unleavened bread out of their houses. And Jesus, from the bread of heaven, there's no sin. We know he represents the unleavened bread's him. Don't break any bones. Why not break any bones? You mm -hmm. couldn't break any bones with this sacrificial animal. Mm -mm. Prophesied that there'd be no bones broken in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why no bones broken? I've mentioned it before. I you remember? Source of blood. Yes. The blood is in our bones. And from a medical perspective, that's where the red blood cells are produced. The blood cells are produced in your bones. So to have life, you have to have marrow to produce in your bones. The middle of your bones, protected in those bones, is your blood cells being made. So <clears throat> Jesus had no bones broken. He still had that spirit of life untouched. Jesus said, I both lay down my life and I take it up again. It's very interesting. Right before Jesus died, he said, it is finished. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And then he breathed his last and died. And 
It was at that instant the temple, the curtain in the temple was torn from Jesus. None of the meat was to be left by, by morning. If they left it, they were to burn it, right? We talked about this before. Why was that? No one else could take of it. It was done. There's no more sacrifice for sin. No more sacrifice was done. Okay. Now we'll get to read a few things. Let's assign these. Exodus 12, 12 to 13. Gail, do you want to take that one? Uh, yes. And Exodus 12, 29 to 30. Who would like to take that one? I can take that. Okay. And Exodus 12, 31 to 36. Okay, you can take that, Janice. Okay, we're going to talk about how the blood was to be a sign. And I'm going to ask, what is the significance of the blood being a sign? Uh, Exodus 12, 12 to 13. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Wow. Wow. The significance of that sign was to them. They had the blood over them. Nothing of the judgment would touch them. Judgment of God. Isn't that good? The blood was a sign. You know that word sign, what it means, remember? Past, present, future, sign significant, just like the mark. <laughs> I mean, I can go on now. We've talked about sign before. Same word. <laughs> Same word. The sign. Judgment fell on Egypt. Let's read about that. Exodus 12, 29 to 30. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all of his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. Mm. What time did the Lord strike Egypt? Midnight. Midnight. The darkest hour, the Lord struck Egypt. Struck down all the firstborn. We know what that meant, don't we? Of men and animals. Why the firstborn of men and animals? We understand the firstborn sons. Yeah, of God's ownership. It's ownership. Animals were under the dominion of mankind. Animals are crucial, even in the world today. Uh, they help us a lot. I mean, we get we get milk from animals. You know, there's domestic animal sheep. But think about the clothing, the protection, the things that happen with animals. Their transportation. The firstborn of the animals, because they were under the dominion, direct dominion of man, right there, of their livestock. Yes. <clears throat> Um, in contrast, because of the blood of the lamb amongst the Israelites, not a dog barked at any man or animal. <laughs> Nothing yeah. happened. You can imagine. And there was loud wailing, as we know. Exodus 12, 31 to 36. <clears throat> then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise, go, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, and they had asked from the Egyptians, articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they had granted them what they requested. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. 
Okay, we're going to stop there. We will start at this next verse the next time, but we're going to go on to the firstborn because there's a few more things we need to cover here. But this is what we'll do, start about the journey of the Israelites and the great deliverance the next time. And there is a slug and a slew of relationships to the book of Revelation in the next study. I will be giving you all kinds of tie-ins to the book of Revelation and the part two of this study because it's it helps it applies it to us, this whole deliverance thing. So <clears throat> we're gonna get some sneak peeks at the book of Revelation ahead of time. I figured might as well do that. So we see here that they urged the people, God's people, and they took their unleavened bread. There was no yeast without yeast, their bread without yeast. They didn't have any yeast with them. Their troughs were bound up in their clothes. Their, their kneading troughs weren't even, nothing was in them. <laughs> no yeast, just this unleavened bread. They took it, they were gonna eat that. They, were, they had to hurriedly get out there. Why hasty departure? <laughs> well, I thought it was interesting because we're always supposed to be ready at any time for the Lord to come. Yes. To be ready. I'm so sorry. You reminded me, Lynn. I forgot it, how they're supposed to eat it. Eat it with the cloak tucked into the belt, sandals on their feet, staff in their hand. Ready to go. Ready to ready go. To go. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> you tied me back to that part that I left out so terribly. It's in those <laughs> studies, in my notes. Yeah. So. yeah. We have to always be ready. We don't know the hour or the time of his coming. And when it comes, it will happen like that. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We can think and try to anticipate. Nope. It could happen for any of us on any moment. As far as our life has ended. We need to be ready. Be ready. It doesn't say get ready in the Bible. I, for many years of my life, I was getting ready. But he didn't say get ready. He says be ready. And the only way we're ready is in Jesus' righteousness alone. So after entering the promised land, God's people did it. They celebrated the feast. They celebrated Passover, feast of unleavened bread. And they also, after they entered the promised land, consecrated the firstborn males of their man and livestock. But it talks about it here, the firstborn here, because it's so crucial to uh, talks about the feast, you're to do this after you enter and you'll keep a memorial, a feast there. And instead of going into detail on those feasts, I wanna just mention some things about the feast and then we'll talk about the consecration of the firstborn because the reason why it's mentioned right here is because it points them to that time when they'd actually be there. Not just this beginning of deliverance, but it's pointing to that time, <laughs> some things that would be happening. There's three feasts in the Old Testament. <clears throat> the Feast of Unleavened Bread, kicked off by Passover, because it's the evening of the 15th day, you might say. I mean, the beginning of the 15th day. The, four, the evening of the 14th day is the beginning of the 15th day. Do you understand that's so related to the 15th day? It's the kickoff of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then there's the Feast of Harvest, otherwise called Pentecost, and there's the Feast of Tabernacles. We will get into those when we get into God's people in the promised land. There's some things that will tie in right there. <clears throat> By the way, the feasts are the clearest Old Testament picture in types and symbols of the redemption of God. The feasts, the three feasts, the clearest symbols, types and shadows of God's redemption mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. And all in the New Testament, I believe the book of Revelation is the clearest picture in signs and symbols. <laughs> that's why it's symbolic language mm -hmm. of God's redemption in Jesus Christ. And it uses those Old Testament symbols to tell us the story of God's redemption. That's what the revelation of Jesus Christ is that book of revelation. It's the clearest picture of God's redemption that you could read in, in, in signs and symbols. In the New Testament. That's why it's so important for us to understand. And I think 
<clears throat> the redemption of mankind is basically kind of told right here in the first feast, in the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, all men are required to attend the three feasts. At the time God appointed it, and in the place that God determined. Now, when this just back really quick back in the creation in the first chapter of Genesis, the sun and the moon were going to be signs to mark things on earth. Sign, we know what that is again. Signs, which is signifying something past, present, future, something significant. Uh, we know that was came and marked in Abraham, a sign of circumcision, sign that they were part of God's people and God's family. The sun and the moon were signs to mark seasons, days, and years. Now, I used to think seasons meant fall, spring. <laughs> I was reading it like a Westerner. <laughs> well, that word seasons is moed. <laughs> and it means appointed time, fixed time, an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't mean whether it's fall or spring. <laughs> they were to mark those appointed times. Moab, Moed, that Hebrew word is used for the three feasts, those appointed times. So it marked those feasts, those appointed times. It marked the days of the month and the weeks. For instance, the Sabbath days, the seven holy assembly days of no regular work, we'll get into those. It would say which day of the month to do certain things, like the 10th day of the first month, you're supposed to choose the Passover lamb, okay? 14th day, you have the Passover meal, 15th day starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So it marks the days, and it marks the new year. The month, you do 12 months, you start over again the first month. And then it also marked the year of Jubilee. I will study that one. That's a cool one, too. You know, all about Jesus there. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, in my notes, I will have all the text, some text here you can look up if you want to read more about it. There are various sacrifices throughout the feast, but this is the highlight of what was required of the people. Seven days to eat the bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day, which is the Passover supper, that Passover supper starts a feast. The first day, remove the yeast from your house. It says in there, whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first to the seventh day, and the first day is the evening of the 14th, right? First day is the evening of the 14th. Because remember, evening and morning. <laughs> you don't have to understand that. Get, get, wrap your mind around it. <clears throat> they would be cut off from Israel whether an alien or native born. If you ate yeast on any of those feasts of unleavened bread, you would be cut off. That word is karat, which means destroy, kill, eliminate. That's pretty powerful. You better not have any yeast. They're not eating any yeast. <laughs> Literally, they can destroy, kill, or eliminate you. We must be totally covered in Jesus, 100% holiness alone. He's the bread of heaven. The first day, they're to hold a sacred assembly. And on the seventh day, completion, they're to hold a sacred assembly. No work at all, except to prepare food to eat. They need to rest in it that way. Jesus appointed the place to eat the last supper, the last Passover. Did you know that? <laughs> okay. Mm. That says that my appointed time is near Matthew 26, 17. I'd like some, I'm going to sign a couple of texts here now. Luke 22, 7 to 18, about Jesus and the Passover, that he kept with his, the, the Passover supper that he kept with his disciples. So who will take that one? Luke 22, 7 to 18. I can take it. Okay. Exodus 13, 1 to 2. Who will take that one? I'll take it. What is it? Exodus what? 13 verses 1 and 2. And there's okay. Exodus 13, 11 and 13, 12 and 13. We'll take that one. Exodus 13, 11 to 13. Who will take that one? That's 12 to 13, right? Exodus 
11 to 13, and then Exodus 13, 14 to 16. He will take that one. That'll mm -hmm. be you, you, Janice. I guess you the last one left there. So Exodus 13, 14. Tim's going to take Exodus 13, 11 through 13, and you're going to take Exodus 13, 14 through 16, okay? Mm -hmm. Will that work? Mm -hmm. Got you all assigned here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here's what Jesus did. Luke 22, 7 to 18. <clears throat> He told us then, to stop. My point of time is near. Okay. <clears throat> then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you the large upper room, all furnished, make preparation. 13, right? They left and found things just as Jesus had told them so they prepared the Passover. How far do I go? To 18. 18, okay. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So there it goes. Jesus said, God had the point where you're supposed to keep the feast. Well, hey, what do you know? Jesus said, I'm appointing a place for you to go. It's a large upper room and it's already prepared for you. Just go there and it's there for you. You're going to have a man carrying a jug of water. I was say he's carrying water. I thought that was interesting. Is water? What is what water represents? Yeah, purifying water, oh, life. Yeah, yeah, the life, water of life. Oh, They're following mm -hmm. him. There's so much significance in this, and so they go and he's the Passover. It looks forward to. It looks back to their deliverance from Egypt, but it's looking forward to the cross, right? It's looking to for the Passover lamb to be sold. Mm -hmm. The unleavened bread pointed to Jesus, the sinless one who gives his life for the world. So this, to me, was just so significant. We're going to move on into the consecration of the firstborn males of the Israelites. <clears throat> Exodus 13, 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. There you go. What is it? Man or animal, the firstborn belongs mm -hmm. to the Lord and God's people. Consecrated. Exodus 13, 11 to 13. This is what you must do when the Lord fulfills the promise he swore to you and to your ancestors. When he gives you the land where the Canaanites now live, you must present all the firstborn sons and firstborn male animals to the Lord, for they belong to him. A firstborn donkey may be brought back from the Lord by presenting a lamb or a young goat in its place. But if it, you do not buy it back, you must break its neck. However, you must buy back every firstborn son. Remember, they were circumcised on the eighth day. And um, but Jesus, Mary brought forth her, which, which son? The firstborn son was consecrated with a sacrifice. You know, that's how they were sacrificed. And Mary brought forth her, the firstborn son out of every womb. That could be any woman. It has her firstborn son. That son must be consecrated because remember Genesis 3.15, pointing to the seed of the woman, that son of man will be born, who is also fathered by God, who is so he is also God's son of God. So <clears throat> Mary brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger, that manger where the sacrifice animals would be eating their food he was circumcised on the eighth day remember though on the 40th day what happened 
they stayed around Bethlehem. In fact, they lived in a house for a bit because they didn't stay in the stable the whole time. They, we, they show up in Jerusalem because they go and clear home. They knew they'd have to consecrate their son. And at the end of her, um, when she, the woman's purification after birth was complete, they took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem on the 40th day when he's 40 days old. Now, it's interesting because uh, <clears throat> for women, by the way, just on the females, it was 60 days, 40 days after purification, after having it. I just think that's funny. So anyway, um, there's a reason for that, but I shouldn't, get in, I shouldn't throw out those little side things. Um, so her purification after birth was complete, and Jesus was consecrated. Remember what happened when she brought Jesus in with, with the pair of turtle doves for the consecration? Anna was there. The prophetess. Anna was there. Who was she? A prophetess. And that she was told that she would see Jesus before she died. The mm -hmm. promised one, the Messiah. And she did. She was a widow for in all those years and lived at the temple waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And who else was there? That she... Simeon was told that. Yeah. Well, what about <laughs> Simeon? What about Simeon? He had a similar message. Yeah. He was there. And he <laughs> took that. And what happened with Simeon? Took that baby and he prophesied over Jesus. Like a dedication. Right? It was a dedication. It was a consecration of what he came down to do. That he would die for the sin. It was very clear what he was going to do. Mm. Spelled out right there. <clears throat> and not long afterwards, here come the kings and they gave him gifts and he had to flee to Egypt. Out of Egypt, God had called his firstborn son. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He had to go to Egypt. They found him in the house. They were about ready to pack up and go back to Nazareth. And here comes the king from the east. The wise men from the east worship the king. Don't you just love him? God announced it to Israel after that. <clears throat> he was still in that area. Um, <clears throat> so, so, Jesus, that firstborn, so the son of the woman. Animals consecrated and they were sacrificed. The firstborn males of, out of every womb of the animal sacrifice but what about the donkeys why was the donkey different have you ever wondered why who what did that the, the, you're wondering why it said redeem with a lamb every firstborn donkey if not break its neck <laughs> why the donkey why was it different than all the other animals there's a reason for this <laughs> i've been thinking i've thought about it already so i have an answer but well but well, it's interesting because donkeys don't reproduce, do they? Aren't they? A, is that on a mule and a horse? Isn't it a cross? Isn't there something it's actually cross. genetic about them? Mule it's a cross a between a horse and a, a, a mule. Right? mule. Oh, yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and they they cannot have, reproduce, have, re reproduce, right? Right. Is that like a mule then? That's a mule. There's mules. And That's there's a, donkeys, but it's yes, mules are the ones that can't. Well, the mules can't. The okay. mules can't, not the donkey. Okay, yeah. the donkey can't. Yeah. Okay, I can remember. Well, I just had it. <laughs> I just had oh that brought God, up to me. I, <laughs> <laughs> I can remember. I knew there was something unusual yeah. about that. Yeah, um, I just, had, I just thought it had to do with the fact that that it too could be delivered. I mean, a deliverance, the deliverance for the, the donkey, um, but the donkey too was what um, Jesus wrote in. To Jerusalem, I was a donkey also. It's directly to that, but there's a whole bunch of other things about donkeys in the Bible. I have a really interesting article. Oh, really? Oh, oh. Well, Balaam, Balaam, his donkey got mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's Balaam. <laughs> and there was uh, Saul, the first king, that the donkeys were lost. And Mary rode a donkey when she mm -hmm. was pregnant with Jesus. Does it mention donkey there? I, I thought it did, didn't it? Oh, that up. But donkeys were used commonly when a king came in peace. Oh, interesting. Horses, it's, culturally, I can't, I can tell you. When a, when a king came in, in peace, 
they would be riding a donkey and that was a symbol. Donkeys, generally. And donkeys were a common way of riding. They would just be, yeah, yeah. They would carry the load, they would take donkeys right. a lot uh, as far as going everywhere they went. It was their transportation, right. you might right. say. And as I understand it, donkeys, when they came with the donkey as kings, they rode in peace. I'll see if I can get that link in that article. I think I ran it off. And I, might, I might post it to an email because there's a whole bunch of things about donkeys I read afterwards. I'd already kind of concluded what I'm concluding here, but it was very interesting to see there's even more to it than I am even sharing here. Hmm. Uh, but uh, donkeys, um, um, what can I say? When they came in war, they came in on a horse. They rode on horses generally. Okay. Because horses were the war animals. I mean, you have to ride a horse to get swift. Kathy or Kathy Wilkins. Excuse so me. basically, the horses were the war horse. You know, you're riding a horse and you're coming to conquer something. <laughs> you know, donkeys. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's interesting. So, let's think about that donkey. For a minute. In fact, I have this here. So Jesus at the triumphal entry on that first day, when he the lamb was chosen, he rode on a donkey. Remember about that donkey. Something was said about that donkey. He was a foal, which in the Hebrew word indicates male or son. It can be used as son. Foal does. So male donkey. A son tied up with its mother. No one had ever ridden it. It most likely hadn't yet been consecrated. An indication was that Jesus, the lamb, redeemed the donkey. <laughs> you know, he was, it was indicated that Jesus was the lamb who rides this donkey. The lamb redeems the donkey. They could redeem it with the lamb. Otherwise, it had to die. Its neck had to be broken. Hmm. To me, that's very significant. At, this, at, the, at that day of uh, triumphal entry, they, they recognized Jesus the son of, as being the son of David. Hosanna to the son of David. So Hosanna to the king of Israel. They were, they were recognizing him. Israelites recognized Jesus as the son of David, who was the king of Israel. That everlasting king promised to be a son to David. The Israelites recognized him on that day. Hmm. <clears throat> well, nothing, nothing said about a donkey. And... Oh, no, there, okay. isn't, there isn't anything. I went and looked too. Yeah. There's nothing said. <laughs> It was right. Re it's referenced. I think it's assumed because that, that was the common way to travel. Right. So I think it was assumed. It's highly likely, but and it talks about Jesus even <clears throat> coming in riding on a donkey. Remember that it talks about, yeah. I think it was referring to the triumphal entry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exodus 13, 14 to 16. Who has that one? That was Janice, right? Talking about the firstborn son, the consecration of the firstborn here. Exodus 13, 14 to 16. So it shall be when the son asks you in time to come, saying, What is this? Then you shall say to him, By strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a sign on your hand and as frontlets between your eyes, for by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt. So, <clears throat> when they say, why are we consecrating the firstborn? Why are we consecrating these animals? <laughs> why are we doing this? <laughs> you tell them. It's because of that day <laughs> that God delivered the firstborn. Right. <laughs> delivered the firstborn. It's like a sign on your hand. Same word for sign as everywhere else we've talked about, symbolizing something. The hand is your strength. It's what you do. And it's going to 
be like a symbol on your forehead. It's symbol is from an unused root word, which means to go around or bind a frontlet. Mm -hmm. Goes around your head, it binds your head. In other words, what you think, I mean this. What you're doing here, consecrating firstborn is a sign of what you're doing. Very interesting, the mark of the beast is a mark in the forehead, how they think, or the hand, what they do. <laughs> Either. But we're God's people in that nation. We're sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit. <laughs> we're sealed for that resurrection, for that inheritance. And we're sealed in our foreheads. We read that in, that, in uh, Revelation 7. Okay. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. God made Jesus his firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. This is Psalm 89, 27. I have these written in the notes. God called Israel his firstborn son. Remember, God, he destroyed Egypt's firstborn sons. He redeemed the Israelite firstborn sons by the blood of the lamb. God's children are sealed in their foreheads. As God, I'll write that, for, finish up my text in here. I don't, didn't write the exact text. As God's sons, we are seated in the promised Sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our inheritance. We belong to the church of the firstborn. Can you read that last second? The, the element you set them on a chair right here. So you have it <clears throat> they belong to the church of the firstborn. We belong, we come in joyful assembly to the congregation of the firstborn. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? That's in, a, that's in Colossians and in Revelation 1. Firstborn from among the dead or from the dead. What does the firstborn from the dead mean? Resurrected. Well, he had to be born before we could be born. To be reborn. <laughs> He was born out of the dead family, you might say. He had that first, he had to be born, first born out of the death. That's uh, right. Resurrection. Out of the yeah. death family. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was that resurrection, yes. And it, the resurrection is proof that he was the son of God, born out, and it throws us in sonship. So, yes, when it talks about him being the first born from the dead, it's because he was, he went to the cross. So everybody get your, if you don't have your grape juice or wine in your cracker, it's a good time to go get it because we're going to do communion here. <clears throat> there was some, there was something that I read you were talking about being sealed. I was reading in John today. Uh -huh. um, when they talk about Jesus being the bread of life and it is in chapter six of mm -hmm. John. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and not, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Yes. That blew me away because I thought we have the seal of approval. Yes. On us. Promise yeah. Holy Spirit. We yeah. have his seal on us. That's the seal. <laughs> he talked about it here. It made me laugh. I thought we got the seal of approval. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's on the handout. John is, it? Yes. Is, it, is it on the uh, handout? I don't see it. I don't know God has placed a seal of approval. I'm going to add it to that handout. That's in John 6 when he's talking about him being the bread. The yeah, it might be in your, in your in the Lord's Supper notes, you mean? It might be in there. I didn't, I, I read them over, but. I don't have them in front of me. They're sitting on the other table. Oh, no, I was just reading that today and this morning. And I'm like, oh, it's a seal six, of approval. John 6 is somewhat what I base the whole bread part of the uh oh okay on the handout for the lord's supper that i sent to you okay yep i looked it over but i didn't read everything so I yeah it says seal approval on there but it needs to be on there that's true god placed on him the seal of approval yeah. yes yes i have the, the, yeah i'll put it in the sealed anyway so john what is that john six um it is let me see hang on a second it would be
It is uh, verse 27. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Six what? 57? 27. 27. 627 on him God has placed the seal of approval you know it's interesting in John 6 there was the big thing comparing to the manna and we will get into the manna a little bit next time no not next time but on the next study which is going to be God's people in the wilderness we'll get into the manna the rock and the manna there's some things there in the day of atonement that we will cover under that study because God's people in the wilderness and show how that ties to us I don't know. I don't think I have that in here. Probably don't have that in there. <clears throat> Jesus came by not by water only, but he came by water and blood. Water signifies, if you go back to first, this is out of first John 5 when it's proving he is the son of God. He says he didn't come by water only. It implies that all of us have only come by water. In John 3, Jesus equates water as being equivalent to mm -hmm. human birth. You must be born again, he tells Nicodemus, for flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. He says, you must be born of water. You have to be mankind. You can't be an angel to be redeemed. You have to be born of water, flesh, and spirit. You see, he, Jesus equated to me, he was just in the same breath, he says you will be born of flesh and spirit. And it's born of flesh and spirit, but you, you must be born of, yes, water, but you must be, you must be born of, so anyway, he equates the two there. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just confusing, don't have that time. So it says, he didn't come by water only. You and I come by water only. Jesus came by water and by blood. And these three testify the spirit, the water, and the blood. They're proving that Jesus is the son of God. And um, so he came with a new bloodline. Remember the blood, the life comes through the blood, comes from the Father, life comes from the Father. We've already talked about this before. He, his blood was different blood in a sense than our blood because he had a different father. He wasn't naturally given life the way you and I are through our earthly fathers. But just like Eve received life, through God placed life through Adam, she got her natural self born and created. She says, you're bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. You see, the blood comes from God, the life-giving blood. See, his life was holy. Anyway, we can talk more about 1 John 5, but I would suggest you read 1 John 5, the whole chapter there, the first section of 1 John 5, and really understand what that meant. The Spirit spoke to me what that was meant. Years ago when I was meditating on 1 John, the whole thing of 1 John, I read it every day for 30 days. And it was towards the end of that time of meditating on 1 John that this stood out. The Spirit gave me an understanding of that passage. The proof of his sonship was he didn't come by water only as son of man, but he came by water and blood as son of God, proving that he's son of God. <clears throat> anyway, the only thing that Jesus ever says to remember us by, he doesn't say keep the Passover, he doesn't say keep the feast, all this stuff. There's no more sacrifice for sin. And every single feast was bloody. <laughs> there was killing of, of sacrifice, every single one of them. Mm -hmm. And the bloodiest of them all was Feast of Tabernacles, by the way, if you want to read about all the sacrifices there. No, if you keep if you take try to keep the feast and don't keep the sacrifice with it, that's a heart of it. It's like taking the heart of the feast out, which was a sacrifice. It pointed to Jesus, the sacrifice, the lamb slain. So I, I really have a hard time going backwards and keeping the feast, <laughs> you know, the way they keep the feast. They don't, the Jews can't even, they can keep Passover, but they don't even have a temple in which to sacrifice an animal. And if they did, what God would they be sacrificing to? If they built a temple, who is the temple in, faith, in honor of? It's certainly not, not in honor of God because he doesn't need a temple. He's not, he doesn't live in temples made by human hands. So if we keep the feast, we're kind of going 
backwards into the old symbols instead of embracing the shadow of Tim, <laughs> whatever, mm -hmm. instead of him. I embrace Tim, not his shadow. <laughs> so embracing Christ, this is why Jesus, on that very night, the last Passover that he ever took with protective on this earth, that last Passover supper, the night he was betrayed, he said, do this to remember me. And it was the Lord's Supper. I believe we can keep the Lord's Supper every day. Mm -hmm. And we can do this every day. That God didn't say you have to go to a priest to have it done. He didn't say you only can do it in church. This is something to remember who he is and that we're one in him. He said, and I believe the Lord's Supper represents us remembering his death and remembering we're one with him. It says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Notice when he goes to the cross, he's called the Son of Man. Because he died for mankind as a man. He had to. The only way he could die is sinner's death. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. It's pointing forward to this points to that. If you have this, you'll have that. It's guaranteed. <laughs> you'll be sealed as a seal of approval upon you. I'm glad you brought that out, Land. <laughs> you'll have that seal of God upon you. <laughs> For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. That was in John 6 as well, the whole passage on the bread. And it's interesting that um, in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 and 17, it says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ, and is not the bread for which we give thanks, uh, excuse me, the bread that we eat, a participation in the blood of the body of Christ. Sorry, I had to, I haven't memorized, but I'm messing it up. Let me start again. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ. And is not the bread that we, for which, that we eat a participation in the blood of Christ? For there's one loaf, and we who are the many all partake, are one body, for we all partake of one loaf. Ephesians 4, 4 to 6 says there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and in all and through all. So this, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he offered mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Tim says, do the bread first. You can tell he's the minister. I was wondering. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I was wondering too. I thought, do the bread first. <laughs> I'm used to doing this on my own. I usually get it right. <laughs> you can see I'm just as human as anybody. <laughs> I'm fluent. But thank you for being so patient, Tim, and reminding me. <laughs> um, Jesus took the bread gave thanks. He thanked the Father that he could be this bread. And he broke it and gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. He was real picky on this. We wanted us to remember him with this. It's all about Jesus, being one with him. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you that we are one body. We're part of yet one body with you that was broken for us. We thank you, Jesus. And then Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. <laughs> he knows what this represents and he's giving thanks. For the joy set before him, he went to the cross. 
And he offered it to them and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you for your death and your resurrection. But because of that, we're sealed. He went on to say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. What do you think he's referring I believe it's a marriage supper of the Lamb. When we're face to face with Jesus, partaking with him ultimate the ultimate celebration of Jesus Christ. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, for whenever you eat his, his body, drink his blood, you show the Lord's death until he comes. And I tell you, we thank you, Jesus. Just in your own heart, just take a moment and just thank, thank him just a moment. <clears throat> yes, we thank you, Father. Jesus, that you died for us. And you rose again. You sealed us, guaranteeing our inheritance. And one of these days, very, very soon, we're going to eat it. We're going to drink with you. We are the many. It was forgiveness of many, the sins of many. Not all are forgiven. The blood you've shed because they haven't received it, but we've received it. We thank you, Lord. We are the many, the one body. So we thank you, Jesus. We thank you so much that we will drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. We are face to face forever with you. In heaven. Thank you for this time we've studied together. <laughs>